few notes that now follow current times uh, simply because uh, it is a fact that one learns over the decades that I've spent uh, watching the stock market that uh, plus a chance, plus a la même shows. And yet, every year, there's some uh, change which has come from nowhere. For instance, as we speak, uh, the central event determining investor sentiment is the, U the Ukraine war. And no one would reasonably have foreseen that three months ago because it's based upon uh, the urgings of a madman in Moscow. And one really didn't think the Russians would put up a madman, but they have, and so we got it. And now the market falls to be considered in that light. There are other interesting features. And I thought I would start with um, some comment on aspects of the Ukraine affair. And uh, I, by casting my mind back 50 years, when on a Saturday morning, I would uh, look in the back of the Financial Times with the uh, odd bargains, which were then known as, well, it wasn't OFEX, it was at the time before then, but it was these are little snippets of companies that are not listed, but whose shares are dealt in. They're things like Weetabix. Well, the one that caught my imagination time and again was bonds from the Tsarist era. Uh, these, of course, have been issued by the Tsars to pay for their hunting trips and things like that. And they were quoted at two or three pounds in a hundred pounds uh, for those who wanted to buy them. I didn't get involved. I was reminded about that uh, on when I later read J.K. Galbraith's The Great Crash, uh, which of course covered the goings on in the twenties and uh, particularly the conduct of the governments of Argentina that's uh, in the past. I'm just saying it's necessary to look at how these bonds accumulate. And of course, we have now some very interesting circumstances arising in the Ukraine and also in Russia. Forget the fact of the sanctions. I don't think that's got a lot to do with it. Once these sanctions are over, there will be matters to sort out in accordance with law. And I, therefore, I think the, the key to it here is to look behind what is going on. For instance, I have myself bought preference shares in Raven Properties, which is London listed and has commercial warehouses in Russia. Uh, where they've let the property out to uh, good tenants. And unfortunately, it does look as if uh, there'll be a blockage on the good tenants paying good rents uh, into the bank account of Raven. Quite what this leaves the ordinary shares worth, I don't know. But I've bought the press at 20p in the 100 pence. And the effect of it is that since they yield 12% at the 100p, they yield 60% at 20p. And I think that's quite attractive. Furthermore, uh, should the Raven press be redeemed, which is possible, then the 20p might well become worth 100p. All I would say is that the market's very thin, so you only buy by appointment, so to speak. And furthermore, uh, it will be a long time before this thing gets sorted out. And quite how it works out, I don't know. But I think it's worth a speculation 
at 20b. And then <coughs> there is the problem of whether the banking system in Russia has now totally broken down. On the investment side, uh, I certainly think it's worth looking at Ukrainian bonds. These are liabilities of the state of Ukraine. And I don't think there's any question of the Russians guaranteeing these liabilities. And equally, it does seem as if Ukraine will continue in one form or another uh, under the control of its citizens. And my attention has been brought to a Ukrainian bond, which on $100 yields $7.33. Well, the bonds got down to $15. So you can imagine what the yield is down there. And rather unusually, uh, they you can buy them in lots of $200,000, which is a minimum. And that's just the way it is. <coughs> However, it's not quite as bad as it looks because at $15, uh, the investor is asked to put up $30,000, which is much more manageable, or at least it was, since the price of these bonds has now increased or advanced to $30. Even so, $60,000 is affordable for many people, and it's worth thinking about. What is perhaps even more interesting is not the running yield, it's the fact that the, these bonds are due to be redeemed in 2033 at, say, $100 in the $100. And that would take the, the price of the bonds up really quite considerably. Of course, as one looks at them on one's television screens and sees the devastation of the Ukrainian economy, uh, one does wonder whether there will be any money to pay anything to anybody by 2033. However, who knows? The Ukrainians have no record of default. And the fact is, they are an industrious and intelligent people. So I think that's worth keeping an eye on. I wouldn't pay more than $30, but uh, it, it is worth having a look at if you do manage to pick up stock at $30. At least so it seems to me. Within the Ukrainian economy, there is an interesting company which has been quoted in London for many years, listed in London. Uh, it's called Ferexpo. That's uh, joining together of ferrous and export. And that produces uh, steel iron pellets, which is the basis for making steel. And it produces a great deal of these pellets. And it does so, or did so, very profitably. In fact, I would think the subject to being able, it's been able to pay its costs as it goes, it's still a very profitable company. However, it's, uh, no one knows how the Russians will control movements of export material uh, for a while at any rate. And therefore, there is risk with Ferex, and how? However, it's only capitalized at about a billion pounds, and it's making a profit of the order, or it was uh, making a profit of the order of 700 million pounds. And therefore, should it get half a chance to leave it, then it will come to be seen as very cheap indeed. I think that's worth a speculation for those who like speculating. I don't see why the Russians think they will benefit uh, the state of affairs by destroying for Expo. Then there can't be an advantage to it. But anyway, that's in the future. I, I certainly recommend 
that investors have a look at Forex Bank. Elsewhere, in this buoyant market for small caps, um, assuming we've got one, I'm not sure we do, and with the prospect of rising interest rates, there are all sorts of other opportunities. Even as I speak, the stock which I highlighted on my master investor column about three months ago, REA Holdings, is still going along very nicely, thank you. Um, and we've had two extra factors that have come out of the, uh, the pack. The first is that REA has got its coal investment going well, and that's making a profit of $2 million a month, possibly considerably more because coal prices have been very firm. And that's going to be spewing money for quite a few months yet. Uh, perhaps uh, another 20 months. So that's $40 million and more uh, from, from, so to speak, nowhere. Uh, which I didn't, when I say nowhere, I didn't foresee that uh, when I commented on REA three months ago. And then the next joker in the pack is that REA's principal uh, product is, of course, palm oil. And uh, one of the substitutes for palm oil is sunflower oil. And I dare say that those of you who ever go into your partner's kitchen will find there is a, a bottle of sunflower oil, which is ideal for cooking fried eggs on Saturday morning. Anyway, the fact is, and as far as I'm aware, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, but the fact is that uh, the sunflower oil is controlled by the Russians uh, now from both Ukraine and elsewhere. Uh, and the fact is that there may not be that much sunflower oil to hand. Anyway, the result is that the price of palm oil has rocketed yet again in uh, the Far East. And I think all this makes some REA yet again, an extremely attractive investment. As I have said at Tedium before, it's also possible to buy the pre REA preference shares, which is surely going to pay off its arrears um, in 2022. And even at the current price, which is about 110p, is still yielding 8% or something like that. And really, I would have thought that's worth acquiring too, if you're a bit of a coward in custard, or just a cautious investor, shall we say. Elsewhere, um, I, dealing with particular companies, um, I draw investors' attention to uh, N. Brown which is a, a textile, women's clothing, principally women's clothing retailer based in Manchester. It was established by uh, Lord Alliance, who came originally from Iran, Mr. David Alliance, about 50 years ago, and who has had a spectacularly successful uh, business life for instance, he and his partner, Harry Ginogli, have developed Coates, the uh, thread providers, and uh, now a very large and successful company. And uh, they, Lord Alliance has turned his mind to Ed Brown, and, and he and his family own about 60% of Ed Brown. And a great success it is too. <coughs> what I don't understand is why it's so lowly rated. It, it, the announcement from the company the other day as to how it's doing was slightly uncertain. I don't imagine that Lord Alliance uh, cares two hoots 
what investors generally think about Ed Brown, since he's got control and can deal with any question of a bid uh, standing on his head. And that being the case, he just wants the thing to continue. And it is. They, uh, the business seems to be making at the moment about um, 10 pence a share net of tax. I have some reservations about that figure because there is going to be a decline in discretionary spending money uh, in the coming months as various costs come through into the British economy. But that said, um, I think um, Ed Brown will be able to cope with that. They're certainly doing very well. And I think they'll go on doing very well. And there it is. It's capitalized at 30p at around 140 million pounds. And it's making net of tax perhaps 46 million pounds a year net of tax. Well, uh, it may be a bit more than that. I don't know. But that's a ridiculous rating. And unlike its competitors, well, they're different companies, but the same business of ASOS and Boohoo, the fact is that this company has net asset value uh, after writing off all the intangibles, uh, N. Brown has a, a net asset value of the order of 340 million pounds. So I can't see why the shares should be at such a discount. And I think for those who have got the patience to give it, say, another 18 months to pay whatever it is this morning, I don't know. 30, 31, something like that. I think if investors are prepared to sit on that for the next, as I say, year and a half, possibly two years, I don't know, they will do very well. And uh, I've certainly loaded up as regards family court court. Uh, I, I also must stress that this company is solvent by miles and they've got huge headroom or unused facilities and huge amounts of cash. So it all, all is well there. Now, another company with which I have lived for a very, very long time is Capita. In fact, uh, it's, it's hard now to imagine uh, how it's sunk so far. It used to be a long time ago in FTSE and was worth billions. Well, capital has really sunk and is now standing at around 22B, at which level it's capitalized at around 400 million pounds. When its results came out last week, the management came out with the advice that the transformation from its troubles of capital is complete. And therefore, the fact that there has been transformation is not in doubt. But the fact that it's complete means I don't think it's reasonable to expect some horrors to emerge, as so many horrors have emerged in the past. And therefore, capita is hugely undervalued. I think it, 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 it's, it's done pre-tax about 93 million pounds, will knock off some tax and you get back to 70. And really, on a P of five, uh, it's got to be worth considering. There are well over 50,000 employees in Capita, and this is a big business. And if the margins will get better, they won't get worse. And as a result, Capita is a screaming buy. I grant you that it doesn't have the uh, same balance sheet as, say, N. Brown, but it's, it's a big business and it will do well in future. So therefore, I think uh, followers can certainly have a go 
at 32p, or Rebecca, I'm not 32p, 22p. Oh, perhaps even pay 30p, I don't know. We'll see how it goes. Elsewhere, uh, on the shorting tag, um, I, I've still put on record that although I lost, lost at least a half a million pounds on Tesla as it goes up, I got some of it back, just hundred thousand pounds. Those of you who are of a true mental arithmetic um, mindset say I've still got to go and um, make four hundred thousand before I even break even. Well, I accept the penalty, and that can happen in life. But I am going to get it back, and I shall get increase my bet the further down Tesla goes. Uh, so I'm not despondent there, I can tell you. Elsewhere on the shorting tag, I've got some ridiculous Swedish company called Sam Halls. Well, that's the abbreviated name, of this very complicated name. And I invite or suggest listeners to go to an item presented by Viceroy Research, which shows or refers to a network of connected party transactions. I don't know how many misrepresentations of companies have been achieved by uh, connected party transactions over the years, but the list is huge. And I always take the view that Connected party transactions means trouble. As a result, I invite listeners to have a look there and then get short of samples. It's a very big market, it's a Swedish company, and the shares are currently about 43 Swedish kroner, and about 13 to the pound. And uh, I think you'll make money on, say, a one year view for the reasons I've just stated. Elsewhere, uh, I've been thinking on the long term, uh, long investment, about investment trusts. I don't particularly like them, but on the other hand, I'm growing older now, and I have to look to investments for my family and my grandchildren, which really will stand the test of time. And if the progenitor of these investments is gaga or dead, the fact is that uh, <clears throat> they, they can't do anything about it. And so I said, I bought you a New Star Investment Trust um, on the basis that uh, you'll leave it alone. Even when I'm dead, I want you to leave it alone for at least 10 years. New Star is controlled by John Duffield. He's got about 70 million pounds involved in it, against a capitalization of the order of 120 million pounds. And net asset value is roughly 200 pence against the current share price of the order of 135 pence. If it were a, a poor management, I would be rather cautious about getting involved in investment trusts on a 10-year, possibly more view. But I wouldn't be. I think this is properly run. And sooner or later, the money will come out of New Star. And therefore, for those who are cautious and want to take a long-term view, this seems to me a suitable vehicle. I would just mention in passing that I did have a, an exchange with Jim Mellon a few years ago about master investor having an investment uh, trust department. Nick Sudbury, who comes up with very good ideas in regards to investment trusts from time to time, would freely admit that there are juicy bits in the investment trust world for long-term investors. The problem is 
that it does take quite a lot of time and work, and it's necessary for the statistical department of such an operation to be paid a proper sum for doing this work. And I'm afraid that under the rules run by the Financial Conduct Authority, this is not possible. I think this is a pity, and I also think that it's illiberal and foolish, but that's what it is. So in a, a valiant effort, as I might see it, uh, I think one should just plow on and do one's best. And I often use Star as your vehicle. I think all that's in the future, and I trust uh, listeners will have an agreeable time uh, in the coming year in two of 2022. That's 2023. Uh, cheerio. Thank you.